Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. I'm Brian Sanders. I'm the creator of Nose to Tail, the Food Lies six-part series, and the Sapien Center Health and Social Club here in Austin. Please go back and start episode one. So many great episodes. This podcast is meant for you to listen to all of them. I only do good episodes. Maybe that's up for debate, but, but I think they're all great. I love my guests. I love my guests today, especially Mark Sisson. He's the man. He's the reason I got started in this health world nine years ago when I read his book, Primal Blueprint. So happy to have him on the podcast again. You can go back and listen to my first episode with him. He really is my hero. He's done so much. He's a legend in the space. He's a successful businessman. He's absolutely ripped. He's 70 years old next month. He's an inspiration to millions of people. He's the man. And so glad to talk to him once again. This time we talk about body mechanics and foot health and barefoot shoes and all this type of stuff a bit different than the first episode. So you can go back and listen to that one, as I said. And we also get to some other health content, what he's eating these days at the end of this episode. But it's good to have a change of pace, talk about something different than just the health stuff, talk about the movement side, the foot mechanics, the body mechanics stuff. A lot of people are into the more barefoot shoes, minimalist shoes, that type of thing. So this is really cool. He's got a lot of insight on this because his new venture is a shoe company called Paluva. He actually gave me a discount code. So use the code SAPIEN if you want to try the shoes out. And here's a little bit more about Mark. Mark Sisson is a renowned health and fitness expert, author, and entrepreneur, celebrated for pioneering the primal lifestyle movement. Once a competitive endurance athlete who achieved a top five finish in the Ironman World Championship, he is now a successful businessman who founded Primal Kitchen, a purveyor of paleo-friendly foods and supplements bought by Kraft Heinz in 2018. In addition to his business ventures, he's a best-selling author with works like The Primal Blueprint that promote ancestral eating and exercise habits for health optimization. Recently, Sisson embarked on a new entrepreneurial journey with his son, Kyle, to create Paluva, a better-for-your-body shoe company. He still produces content on his legendary blog, Mark's Daily Apple, and is absolutely ripped and supremely healthy despite turning 70 next month. So yeah, that's Mark. He's a man. He's inspired me. He's inspired millions. I uh, hope you enjoy this one. Please support nosetotail.org. Get all your good stuff there, and we'll see you next week. Hey, hey, Mark. How's it going? Good, Brian. And you? Oh, I'm great. I am having a good time here in Austin. I am wearing your shoes, which will come up in this episode. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, how are you doing? Great. I just got in off of a brutal uh, hour and 50 minute ride outside in the Miami sun on the sand on a fat bike. And uh, so I'm fried in a good way. <laughs> and uh, I took a friend of mine out uh, and, and uh, showed him the ropes. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> a very a very fit friend who uh, uh, had a, new, a renewed appreciation for what we do on the sand here. Well, that's cool. Well, you're living the life. You're in Miami. You got the, what's it called? Uh, fat tire bikes. You got the foil. You got the ultimate Frisbee. What else you got? Yeah, I mean, stand up paddling. I did a, a nice long paddle yesterday. Um, again, the water now at this time of year, the water's getting warm. Not that it ever isn't warm. I mean, one of the reasons I moved here five and a half years ago, uh, one of many reasons, was the water is 20 to 25 degrees warmer than it is in Malibu, where I spent the last, the prior 30 years. And I'm a big fan of warm water. So mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of cold water. Do a plunge once in a while, mind mm -hmm. you. But I choose to do that. You know, if I'm going to get in the water, I want the water, you know, and swim and frolic and whatever paddle I want. To, I want it to be a little bit warmer than I'm used to. I know what you mean. Yeah, I didn't really go in the water in L.A. I was kind of like, I'll just go back home in Hawaii and we'll, we'll get like the nicer. Right. But uh, all right. Well, so everyone knows you. You're the legend in the space. I uh, I actually was wearing your shoes and this, uh, I was wearing them at the Sabian Center and this guy, this investor guy was like, oh, what are those shoes? Those look so much better than like Vibrams. And I said, well, they're Mark's new shoes. They're, it's called Paluva, if anyone's listening, um, hasn't heard of it, I guess it's pretty new. And he said, you know what, Mark, I, I read his book like 12 years ago and it just, that was my start to the health space. It changed my life. And I said, you know what? I have the same story. That's all I did. I read Primal Blueprint nine years ago, and I, it wow. was off from there. Wow. I mean, look, I've done, uh, I'm 10 books into this, uh, this journey of mine, writing and educating and uh, trying to change the world for the better. 
And the primal blueprint is still my baby. It's still the, my, my, I think it's my magnum opus because it really lays out uh, the sort of philosophical foundation of everything I've done, right? It, it really, it always points back to evolution as the, as the guiding light, evolution as the, as the answer. And whether science comes up with new, you know, uh, spinoffs and new directions, you know, I look at everything we do in life through the lens of evolution. And, uh, and uh, you know, look, sapiens, I mean, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're in that same kind of context and look, looking at th through the same lens. But uh, the Primal Blueprint sort of laid that out for everybody and painted a, painted a picture of how, how we got to where we are now. And then my subsequent books were more like, all right, how do we take that information and, and incorporate it into, a, you know, a, into an action plan to lose weight, action plan to get more fit for endurance, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. That's the guiding light. And I love that. So we're working on the film still daily. That's going to be my magnum opus. We turned into a six part series. I just updated you a little bit and showed you the trailer. And of course you're going to be in it. We interviewed you like four years ago, right? Something. I, I, I mean, talk about a labor of love, Brian. <laughs> yeah. That was four years ago. Yeah. Well, exactly. we're still working. I'm telling you. you know, what was that in a warehouse in, out in, out in uh, the Valley? Oh, well that was another thing. Okay. I'll tell that story real quick. No, we got you in Miami in the condo okay. oh, for there, the there film. Yeah. But what we yeah. did, no, I'm glad you brought that up. We had uh, Sean Baker, Dr. Paul Saladino, you and me sat down in the chairs. Oh, it was such a treat to do that. We had a plan at Paleo FX. Um, oh, that's right. 40, we made it happen. And you know what? This is crazy. Hey, everyone just want to jump in real quick to talk about nose to tail.org. This is my company. This is how everything is possible. We do the best products. You can get quality boutique products. We do regenerative ranching. We have the best meat delivered to your door. You can get that at nosetail.org. We have body care products made from beef tallow. We have dried meat snacks called biltong that has no sugar, no curing agents. We have ones with liver in it. We have organ meats. We have primal ground beef with organ meats in it. We have deodorant. We have hair products. We have so many great things that support your ancestral lifestyle, clean ingredients, no funny stuff, all animal-based, using the whole animal. That's why it's called Nose to Tail. Go to nosetail.org. We have free shipping options. We have other shipping discounts, and we're supporting small local operations here in Texas. So support us. Go to nosetail.org and go to yes2meet.org. Yes to Meet is the new movement. Find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We have a great newsletter. It is so good, so valuable. Get on the newsletter, yes to meet.org. So you told me we were sitting around waiting for Paul and you're like, you know what? I'm going to buy Vibrams maybe. Maybe I'll buy Vibrams. They're just like, they just don't look very good. And I was like, ah, oh, interesting. And then all of a sudden Paluva comes around. Yeah. Not all of a sudden, but you know, <laughs> subsequently. <laughs> so, yeah. well, yeah. What's the story there? So you're just like, well, maybe I shouldn't buy them. Maybe I just do it myself. I mean, it's a long involved story, but um, after I sold... Primal Kitchen, um, I was, yeah, I tried to be retired for a little bit and it, it didn't work and I knew it wouldn't. Um, I, I have to be doing something. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, fascinated by foot health and foot comfort my entire life. Um, and I mean, this goes back to when I was first starting to run in my early teens and I was running in, uh, you know, Chuck Taylors and Converse. There were really no running shoes in those days. Um, it wasn't even a thing yet. Jogging wasn't even a thing yet when I started mm -hmm. running in 1960. Five, um, and then um, in the early days of my running experience, I was running in Tiger Onitsukas, which was Phil Knight's first brand. The very thin, flat, minimalist shoe. And what it did was it sort of forced the runner to adopt a true human running gait, which was to land on the midfoot um, and not heel strike, but to land on the midfoot and then and then uh, absorb the shock. Uh, through the ankles and knees and through the hips, uh, through this uh, wonderful hardwiring that we all have, where as soon as your foot hits the ground and knows the orientation of the tilt of the of the landscape, knows how to weight uh, the body, how to again how to flex the knee, how to how to bend the ankle, how to torque the hip, how to flex certain muscles to absorb the shock, and that was, and that's dictated by a thin sole, right? So if you if you had a thin sole in those days doing 40 or 50 miles a week was all you could do because it was really, it was difficult to maintain that 
basic human gait, that natural human running form, which later became memorialized in Born to Run, say, uh, you know, Chris McDougall's book, or where Barefoot Ted, uh, and even later on, the pose method came in about teaching people how to run. In those days, that because the shoes were so thin, you couldn't run that many miles. Then along comes Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman and these thick Nike heels, and all of a sudden, it encouraged people to heel strike and, and to and to move away from this natural human gait and adopt this sort of unnatural running gait. But because of the cushioning, it allowed you to put in a lot of miles. And you now it wasn't your feet that told you when to stop. Mm-hmm. It was either your lungs and your heart because you were doing so much cardio work that you got tired. Mm-hmm. Or it was your lower back or your knees because now you were missing this important haptic sense, this important information going up through the foot to the brain to tell you how to weight the foot. All of that was being bypassed by these thick, restrictive, cushiony shoes, which when you tried them on in the store, they felt amazing. You walked down the aisle of the shoe store mm-hmm. and you said, these are great. These are soft. These are in, But once you started running in them, the problems started to accrue. And over the last, you know, it's now been 50 years since the advent of these high-tech modern running shoes. And there has been no decrease in running injuries. Um, you know, half half of runners get injured uh, every year, and 25% of runger, runners are at, at any one time are injured. 25% mm. of all the runners in the country are injured at any one time. So it does not speak well for the running shoe industry. So I was always interested in like, okay, how do we, you know, how do I bypass that? How do I take care of my entire body from the soles of my feet all the way up through the kinetic chain, all the way up to my head? And uh, so I was I was fascinated with foot health. I read Chris McDougall's book, Born to Run. I was an early adopter of those first five-toed shoes. I thought they were great, but you couldn't run in them because they were there was no cushioning and there was no, I mean, even you couldn't even do a lot of miles um, with the normal human stride because it was though they were so thin there was, you know, there was zero cushioning. Mm. And um, and then over the years, uh, other. Minimalist shoe companies came in and started to create wider, thinner, flatter, flexible shoes, which was a good thing. Um, but, you, you know, if you were going to run, you had to really train your feet very well. And so I started thinking, well, you know, what about um, what if what if foot health was um, more about what you do when you're not running? In other words, what if we could create a shoe that you wore all day long that that improved your mobility and improved your flexibility, improved the strength in your feet and opened up the big toe, which this was, this has been an issue for shoes for since the beginning of shoes, which is Mm -hmm. modern shoes restrict your toes. They, they cramp them. Um, I can't wear modern shoes for that reason, but modern shoes tend to, um, in the, in the name of vanity and fashion, uh, tend to, sort of reward this kind of narrow toe box that might look attractive, but is wreaking havoc on most people's feet. And so people have bunions, they have plantar fascia, they have uh, have fasciitis, they have, you know, all sorts of issues from modern footwear. So I I wrote a book a couple of years ago on foot health and how you can, you know, certain uh, exercises that you can do and walking barefoot and, and foot massages and all the stuff that you can do. But I was really looking at the industry going, well, how come no one has created the most updated next generation version of a minimalist shoe that incorporates the best elements of a minimalist shoe, gets rid of that thick, cushioned, you know, overly, and then all of the all of the tech that's in there, the, the forefoot motion control and the rear foot stability and all of the, you know, the high tech um, things that they talk about in footwear like it's a good thing, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it actually it's not. It's a bad thing. Um, and so we, my son and I set about to design from the ground up. Um, you know, we, we looked at the five, the current five-toed shoe um, offerings, and and just said it's it's not where we want to go. We want to reinvent this and make the optimal shoe for everybody, an ideal shoe that you could wear all day long, uh, that would provide all day comfort, uh, that would. Um, encourage flexibility and mobility in the feet, uh, and that would be the most comfortable shoe you've ever worn. 
um, and would be functional and ultimately would be stylish too. I mean, that was the, the three criteria were mm-hmm. um, comfort, number one, function, number two, and style. Mm-hmm. And so this, this is what became my new company. It's called Peluva. Uh, we launched about four months ago. We're we're doing extremely well. We're we're like over the top excited about the responses we're getting from, you know, the fitness influencers and the in the foot mobility influencers who are using the shoe and and commenting on, you know, how how great it is. I've got uh, a reflexologist who's been doing uh, foot massage for twenty six years. She she lives in them now. She has like three pair. That's all she wears. She's like, oh my god, I've been waiting for this shoe my whole life. So um so that's. <laughs> That's how I got here, right? Uh-huh. Well, it's great. Yeah, no, it's just I, I just think it's cool that I was there, kind of in the beginning stages, just just sitting around. Well, so you, but you, you, you heard my enthusiasm, right? You heard four mm-hmm. years ago, or five years, you heard that, you know, that was as passionate as I was about food. I'm probably mm-hmm. more passionate about foot health and this this connection that all of us have with Earth and how important it is to maintain strong, functional, healthy feet, uh, whether or not it, you, you, you know, it, whether it's balance or whether it's, uh, tr- is true mobility, like how we get through this world, we are always planted firmly on the ground. And, and the minute we put on restrictive encasing, uh, overly cushioned shoes, we, we bypass all of that amazing information. It's like, if you took a our feet are just like our fingers, right? Toes are supposed to articulate. They're supposed to spread out and articulate and feel the ground underneath. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we do that, our balance is better. Our strength is better. Um, The kinetic chain from the soles all the way up through the hips, through the back and up to the neck uh, is improved. Our biomechanics are improved. Um, Our flexibility gets improved because we're not shortening the calf muscle because we've got an artificially raised heel off the ground. Mm-hmm. You know, all of these things are are critical to our connection with earth and critical to our health. And so I would say, you know, foot health is the new sleep, right? Is mm. with the last 5 or 10 years people have been really addressing sleep and you've got all these, you know, the aura ring and the and the eight sleep and the chili pad and all these sleep assist devices to improve the amount of time and the quality of your sleep. And I'm suggesting foot health because of the time you spend walking and the time you spend standing, the time you spend moving around, changing position, uh, mm-hmm. foot health is critical to your, um, your being able to, to perform, uh, maximally in life. Mm. Yeah. It seems like it's kind of one of these long-term investments too. It's like people don't really consider it until it's too late. That's right. A, no, I, you're, you're a hundred percent right. The number of people, something like 77% of people Forget the running community that I just talked about with 50% injured every year. Mm-hmm. 77% of people complain of foot pain at some point in their life. And that's that's just wrong. That's why why should that be in this modern age when we've got all of these, we've got access to all this technology? Well, the answer is because we've sort of, again, um, we've gone down this path of cushion shoes being preferable. Um, and then ironically, the more your feet hurt the more a cushioned shoe feels mm. good better yeah. for the short term, but the worse it is for you for the long term, right? So a cushioned shoe, if you've got bad feet, a cushioned shoe is going to feel great for, you know, half an hour, hour, maybe an hour and a half, but then spend a day in it. And all of a sudden, all the things that were wrong get get amplified and exacerbated because of it. Mm, so, yeah, it's like a brace. It's yeah, it's like, I've heard people talk about it. Luckily, there are people speaking up on it. It's like you're just in a cast almost. It's like having this cast that's it, it, it's like a cheat device that doesn't serve you in the long term. Oh, that, are, like yeah. orthotics would be a good example. Um, and, and I'm a great example of that. I, mm. I was one of the first miracle cures with orthotics back in 1976. Mm. A podiatrist by the name of Stephen Sabotnik out of Hayward, California, was the first sort of runner's podiatrist. And um, I had spent uh, my senior year in college sitting out because of chondromalacia in my knees. And the diagnosis was that I overpronated and blah, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, and so the, the, the fix, the, the so-called fix, the cure, was to put orthotics in my Nike, my cushioned Nike LDVs. And for a short period of time, I got better, right? Because I, it was like a Band-Aid on that solution. So I wasn't mm-hmm. 
over pronating and uh, I was using the orthotics to support my arches and prevent me from rolling in. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was that the shoes were too cushioned. And as a result of my doing 100 miles a week of running, because the cushioned shoes allowed that and in, and sort of encouraged that that heel striking, um, I, I, I bypassed all of that you know, important information and I never really fixed the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't until I, you know, I started spending more time barefoot, uh, doing barefoot exercises that I weaned myself off the orthotics, but I know people who have been wearing orthotics for, you know, 20 years and, and they think, well, that's because, you know, a lot of people wear orthotics because they say, well, I have, you know, I have uh, flat feet or I have no arches. Uh, Brian, nobody is born with bad feet. I mean, you know, obviously some people are, but but generally people are born with perfect feet um, for their physiology, for their familial genetics. They have perfect feet and it's just a matter of of strengthening them and developing them through infancy and then through uh, childhood and then through adolescence and then through adulthood, developing the muscles of the small, the small muscles of the feet. But if you say, well, I have... I have uh, bad arches and so I need orthotics. Well, you have bad arches because you haven't done the work to build an arch. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, um, I'm, I want stronger biceps, um, but hmm, I better not go to the gym and, and do curls. Uh, I better just wear a brace on my arm and hope that my, my biceps get stronger. They're not going to get stronger. You have to do the work. And the work includes using the small muscles of your feet. And that's where almost every minimalist shoe comes into play. Most mm. of the minimalist shoe movement recognize that we don't move the muscles of our feet enough. And so they created shoes that allowed this wide, thin, flat, flexible uh, shoe to encourage the movement of the small muscles of the feet. The biggest issue with most of the minimalist shoes is they don't allow the toe articulation, the individual movement of the toes, not just splayed out from side to side, but up and down as well, because you want your toes to be involved in the movement, not just as one, not just as a mitten, but as a glove, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be mm -hmm. able to push off the big toe almost independently. Um, and so we talk, you know, at, at, uh, uh, at um, Paluva, we talk about big toe alignment and, and realigning the big toe, because for so many people, it's been squished into the rest of the foot. There are people who say, well, you know, but Mark, I buy like, like I buy triple E shoes and my feet still hurt. Well, they, they hurt because the shoe, the triple E, the width is wide at the, at the metatarsal, but then they all point back in. The sh Even mm -hmm. though the metatarsal part, like the midfoot is wide enough, it doesn't matter if you don't continue the width outward mm -hmm. to the big toe and through the little toe. So we've, we've created a, a shoe that allows for this individual toe articulation so that you can, every time you step on a, a rock or a root or you're bounding across uh, a trail um, and every time your foot lands, it lands differently, you want the toes to be involved in the feeling of that movement and, and to be giving information to the brain as to how to bend the knee and how to flex the hip and how to, how to torque the, mm. the foot and the ankle. So the um you know the the minimal shoe industry has has done a fairly good job of accommodating this we've just taken the best elements of that and improved upon mm. them so we do have the five toed articulation we did add a little bit more cushioning i'm talking about 3 millimeter of uh just a a, a cushiony material not not an not an inch not a third of an inch just less than you know, like an eighth of an inch of cushioning mm. material that just is just enough to allow you to say spend an hour or two walking uh, the streets of Manhattan in these shoes and not feel like you're getting a bone bruise or a stress fracture. Um, in the original mm. uh, five-toed shoes, I would I'd feel very comfortable wearing them for you know uh, on grass and on uh, trails. But once I got on pavement, uh, you know after two or three miles, I would start to feel it. So. One of the first things I did was create this, uh, the, one of our models is called the Strand, and it's the workout model, and it's the one that I, I put 650 miles on the road on one pair of them last summer in Europe, just wear testing the crap out of them. 
Um, and I would do anywhere from six to 12 miles on pavement most days, in addition to the trail running and stuff like that, because I wanted, I wanted to feel like I was able to navigate um, the, the urban jungle, the modern world with a barefoot experience. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say that, you know, we, we did evolve to go barefoot and many books have been written on it. And Daniel Lieberman, who I, I think you probably know is, you know, wrote some of the early studies on that. And then Chris McDougall did his whole book on born to run. There've been a lot of, a lot of studies done on, done on, on barefoot. So we were born, certainly born to run and we were born to run barefoot. But the problem is modern society. You know, we evolved for millions of years. These, these wonderful feet, these organs that we have that are in contact with the ground evolved barefoot, naked on tamped down grass, matted uh, savanna, uh, packed dirt, um, uh, pine needles, uh, you know, all sorts of different surfaces. Mm -hmm. They did not evolve on pavement, concrete, marble, tile, hardwood floors. And you look at all of the, the surfaces that we walk on these days, very rarely do we, do we not walk on something that isn't hard. So we wanted to build a shoe that had uh, the effect of the feeling uh, when you're walking on pavement. It, we wanted to give you the feeling of walking barefoot on a putting green. So that was mm. sort of the, that was the metric that we used, right? Does mm -hmm. this feel like walking barefoot on a putting green? Yeah. Just say, well, we're, no, you're right. Cause I wear them road running, right? So I sprint on the pavement. So I do need that extra cushion. I think that really helps. That's now you that's wore, how I you wore what road running? Yeah. Your okay. shoes. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I wear them and it works well because that's what I have to offer. It's outside the saving center. There's a street. I don't have a lot of room to yep. sprint. I sprint okay. the street. That's just where I do. Yeah, yeah. So great, great point. So what we tell people with our shoes is, um, is don't run in these, don't run distance in these. Okay. And that the big caveat is, uh, you can, but you got to spend a lot of time adapting, not just your foot and your foot strength, but your running style to, get away from a heel strike because these will not encourage a heel strike. On the other hand, sprinting, because you're not heel striking when you're sprinting, these are perfect for sprinting. So anything that you would do, say barefoot on the grass, you can put on the paluvas and go do barefoot on pavement, which I think you've, that's been your experience, right? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's what I do. But also maybe I should say that I grew up yeah. barefoot. And so, maybe I came at an advantage where my feet were ready for this too. Cause I could just go do them the first day and felt that's, fine. And that's great. And like I said, I, you know, I can, I think I've run in these and, and they're because I've been doing this for 15 years before Palua's came along, I was doing the other five toed shoe. And, um, you know, mm. I just stopped wearing it because I thought they were unattractive and I, I felt I could improve on it. Uh, so I would say most people, um, even to runners, what, what I would say is this is the perfect shoe for when you're not running. So when you're running, put on your running shoes. We're going to develop one one day, but right now we don't have one. Put on mm -hmm. your running shoes, go out and do your run, and then put on your paluvas and walk around. And it'll feel like your feet are being massaged. You'll feel your, your toes will widen because of the, the natural toe splay and toe articulation. Um, it is what we would call recovery for your feet. It's active recovery. Mm -hmm. It's actually passive training because... While you're walking along in paluvas, your feet are being called upon to do, you know, there is no arch support in paluvas, so you're, you're working your arch. Um, uh, whether you're walking on a treadmill or upstairs or whatever, you on your toes, you are building back the small muscles of, of your feet. So the amount of time that you spend wearing paluvas throughout the day will benefit you when you put your running shoes on and go to run. Um, mm. so that's kind of the, that's what we like to encourage people to, to do it that way rather than just, you know, uh, start running in them. Go Well, maybe I'm doing it wrong. It's working no, no, for no. me. And, and I, I, you I, know, I, again, I just, we want to be careful because uh, I think a lot of people who, mm. who Im read the book born to run got injured because they, 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 they were like, Oh, this sounds like a great idea. I run 60 miles a week. I'll go run five miles the first day in, in, in my minimalist shoes. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem was because they were running 60 oh, miles a week with, with thick cushioned heel striking shoes. And then you can't, you can't do that in minimalist shoes. You can't heel strike. It just, 
you know, it hurts, oh, it hurts too much. And it's, and it sort of trains you to run the proper way. But then when you run the proper way, if you haven't trained in that context, now it's, there's a lot of calf muscle involved. There's a lot of loading the Achilles, right. And loading the plantar fascia. So you want to be careful when you do that. But, um, you know, I, I, a lot of people these days are wearing toe spacers, toe spreaders. Have you seen this phenomenon? Mm. Dude, I, I got some a couple weeks go. ago. Right. And things. so, and, and there, it's a great idea. Yeah. And so every, you know, kind of foot health guru on Instagram and on YouTube is promoting mm. toe separation and toe, toe spreaders. Well, with that, a lot of people, women in particular, you know, they wear them around the house. They put them on while they're watching TV at night. Maybe they sleep with them on. But imagine if you if you were able to walk around and 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 now not just spread your toes but articulate them and move them up and down and and bend and and sort of bias to one side or the other as you're walking and as you're moving. Well, that's what we offer with mm -hmm. the Palubas. We basically put what amounts to toe separators, toe spacers, in these shoes, and then give you the opportunity to utilize those mm -hmm. throughout the day through walking, stair climbing even standing around. You're doing stuff that you wouldn't otherwise do wearing mm. the, the toe spacers. Because I think the toe spacers is kind of a, um, while you're watching TV with your feet up on the, you know. Yeah. Well, it's it's good maybe to get it going. I just wanted to re-spread out my toes. And, you know, maybe it's like the training oh, I wheels. Don't, I think they're but great. You, you I think wanna, they're awesome. I would not. Yeah. But you want to do the yeah. active. You want the active version. It's like active stretching. Like, I don't want to just sit there and stretch. I do active right. stretching. I mean, there are people now who are Walmart. wearing them in their other wide toe box minimalist shoes, right? So there are people who are wearing them mm. with their Vivos or with their Alters or their either, you know, which is an interesting concept. Mm. Um, it's just that we, we sort of offer that. And because in a regular wide toe box shoe, you can't move your toes up and down individually, right? They have to, yeah. go, they have to go sort of in concert with one another. Um, yeah. We offer that, I think, unique perspective, uh, which only one other company offers. And, and that is uh, this ability to uh, individually articul articulate the toes and, mm. and strengthen them uh, the way you would if you were home doing exercises barefoot in your house. Yeah. So I want to go back to the the uh, arch well for what no the root cause that's what i want to talk about because the root cause is big it's like we always talk about this stuff with health and you, you just want to put it like take the pill or put on the band-aid right but it's like you have to go to the root you cause want the ozempic the Ozemp oh ozempic <laughs> i just posted about that what was it you're gonna get it's all nah. good until you get cancer and something <laughs> that's else. right anyway everybody wants the ozempic Everyone they don't want to do the work. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a, the, there's no free lunches in nature. Right. So it's like you have to, yes, I did have those orthotic things for a while because I have a huge arch. I have the opposite problem, which I wanted to talk about. So I have this giant arch and it, it hurt when I wore like, I was playing a lot of flag football and I'm like crimping down my feet in these tiny shoes. And then my, it hurts so bad. Yeah. And the doctor's like, you got to get some arch support if you're wearing these flat little, you know, football shoes. And then I realized, well, no, you can't just take the easy way out. You have to, your feet have to learn to build that muscle. And I think that's what I did. So I grew up in Hawaii barefoot. So I, so tell me what you think. Did I get this giant arch? Like this was the arch I was born to have. And I developed it by going barefoot my whole childhood. Is that what's possible? No, it's possible. So what happens, what I would say is uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, the radius of your arch uh, is a genetic uh, predisposition. Mm -hmm. So when you, um, when you are born and, you know, some people are born with flat feet, flat arches, doesn't mean their arch muscle doesn't, doesn't work. It just doesn't look like an arch when, when, when they're, um, grown up, it, it may appear as flat feet, but if they're doing the work and, and, it, and if they're doing the work, they might not even develop a pronounced arch uh, with it, with a, with an increased radius, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean their feet aren't strong, supple, um, and, and able to do everything that anyone else can do. Um, it's just a visual thing for most people. So mm -hmm. you're probably born with a higher arch. And there are people with high arches who don't train them, who have uh, foot pain, because even though they have a higher arch mm -hmm. with, a, with a greater radius, looks like a nice arch, but if, but if they haven't trained it, it's, it's not functional. Um, so, uh, you know, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a bodybuilder with huge muscles, but can't lift, can't outlift a power mm -hmm. lifter you know, mm -hmm. who trains specifically for doing the work, right? 
Um, so I would say, you know, with regard to you playing flag football, uh, yeah, just building the arch. Uh, and it was probably an appropriate use of an arch support or an orthotic in that context of playing a sport, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what we talk about with Paluva. We say, do your training and do, you know, uh, and live your life in Paluvas. And then when it's time to do your sport, put on your individual sport shoe. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all, we, are, we already have plans for making a turf cleat and some other stuff, but there's a, a lot of uh, additional technology that has to go into that to accommodate this, you know, when you, when you build a shoe for a specific sport, you have, you have to take into consideration the, the demands of that sport. Uh, and so you can't just say, okay, just wear paluvas for everything you do. So yeah. we say, th go throughout the day. And by the way, Brian, we make uh, several different models. So we make the trainer, which is called the strand. And that's the one that you go, you, I would take to the gym. I would lift weights in it. I would do squats, lunges. I would uh, do stair climbing. I would hike. I, um, you know, um, Brad Kearns, he just did a nine mm -hmm. hour hike in a pair of strands up uh, mm. uh, Cactus to Clouds. Uh, my buddy Tom Hodge goes rucking with a 30 pound backpack, only wearing the the, the lightweight paluvas, uh, no socks. And he's passing, you know, guys with massive, with hike, hiker poles and, uh, uh, thick, you know, hiking boots with, you know, mm -hmm. inch, two inch thick heels on them. So we say spend your day working in Paluva. So we, we have some, I have a leather, uh, you know, this is, I don't know if you, you for those of you who, if you've got, do you have people watching? Video, video? Yeah, yeah, okay, so, too. All right. So this is like our going, this is a, a casual shoe. This is called the Miami of all things. Um, it looks mm -hmm. like it has a really thick, you know, sole. It doesn't, that's a trompe l'oeil. That's fake. That's made to look like a stylish shoe it's still only one centimeter off the ground um we have, we have that white as well uh and then we have a um you know the, the again the strand the one i was talking about the this is our blue strand this is the one that people are working out in hiking in again it's wide thin flat flexible you know it, it's it's only nine millimeter stack height from heel to floor um we have leather nappas we have the leather lace-ups for going to work I'm, it's what i would call weddings for weddings and funerals you know you can you can wear that and not get kicked out. You get, you'll be stylish mm -hmm. with your, you know, your Tom Ford outfit or whatever you're wearing. So we want people mm -hmm. who understand the the benefits and the comfort of toe freedom to be able to say, okay, not only do I get to wear these shoes in the gym, but I get to wear them the rest of the day in whatever lifestyle context. Because one of the things that happened to me was as soon as I got into wearing minimalist five-toed shoes, as soon as I got out of them and put on my, you know, whatever my designer shoes were, I don't care how wide the shoe was in terms of its, you know, E, E, triple mm -hmm. E, whatever. Yeah. It still came to a point at the toes. Even if it was rounded, it still forced the toes in. So I couldn't spend more than an hour in, in any dress shoe in any context, whether I was sitting still or walking, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, so we said, let's make, let's make a shoe that you could spend the whole day in and get the benefits, the, mainly the comfort, because they're the most comfortable shoes you'll ever wear, but also the function. And then when it's time to come to, to play your sport, get out your orthotics if you need them. And by the way, you, after a while, you won't need them because you'll train yourself. with. Oh, each. I don't. Yeah, okay. They broke and I yeah. left them behind years and years ago. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And we would say that if you, spend, if you spend enough time, you know, a couple weeks wearing these, your arch will get stronger as a result of that. And then when you go to put on your, you know, your, your soccer cleats, or your football cleats, or your baseball cleats, or your basketball mm -hmm. shoes, or whatever, um, you'll be better off for it. A uh, little yeah. anecdote here with regard to basketball shoes. Uh, my uh, son, uh, who's 5'10", has been doing a lot of uh, knees over toes guy training, right? Ben Patrick's mm -hmm. training. And uh, he's gotten to where he can, you know, get, he can get above the rim. He can actually dunk a basketball. Mm. Um, but... Um, he found that he could jump higher in his Paluvas than he could in his Jordans because when, uh, unless you're starting from a stand, a standing position and lowering yourself like a center would, most people who are going to duck a basketball are going to take a run up, a run up, plant the foot, and then leap off that foot to hit the basket, right? Or to, to hit the rim. Mm -hmm. So once you plant the foot, the cushioning in the heel of the, 
basketball shoe takes away from the spring. It literally un mm. it unloads the spring that is already ready to go in your Achilles and your your calf Achilles and plantar fascia. That's a coiled spring ready to jump. And in mm -hmm. and in 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 uh, any sort of cushion shoes, as soon as you weight that heel and then try to jump off it, you lose you lose an inch, maybe an inch and a half in spring. So that's that's an anecdotal thing, but he reported that. He's like, this is really you know, kind of interesting and it makes total sense in the context of using the foot to its greatest potential oh. and not encasing it in some uh, restrictive cushioned box that encourages atrophy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Wait, that makes sense. I like thought experiments. Also, I was a mechanical engineer. If you took a boot and like a shoe and stuffed it with cotton balls and then tried to jump, how you would never be able to jump high. Of course. It, of course. It just... A, big layer of con balls that would soak that thing right. up when you're trying to take exactly. off. Exactly. So the barefoot would be the ideal way. And, you know, and if you look at high jumpers, for instance, high jumpers, high jumping shoes are thin, 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 right? They're just, there's nothing there. Just, mm -hmm. just enough to, um, to prevent injury from direct contact with the track mm -hmm. as you're running down. Um, because it, 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 all of the jump springs from that, kinetic chain that starts with your contact with the ground. And as soon as you dampen that contact, as soon as you, um, you know, uh, uh, put all of that force and energy in that spring into a uh, shock absorbing device, you lose, you lose the power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I grew up high jumping as well, and <laughs> pole vaulting and all you that pole stuff. You pole vaulted? Oh, I pole. I still pole vault. I've been talking to Katie Wells about pole vaulting. Her whole family pole vaults. I've been nerding out with her. So I, I, I started pole vaulting in, when I was twelve years old in my backyard with a bamboo pole from a, a that they used to they used to deliver carpets, rugs on bamboo poles. And so I, my dad, who had been a pole vaulter in his youth, it, literally mm. in the in the nineteen thirties, uh, taught me how to pole vault. So I was my original um, track team. Uh, events were the mile, the two mile, and the pole vault. Pick pick three more or two more disparate events, right? Oh yeah, and the the discus, not the shot. <laughs> right, I don't know. right. <laughs> well, I tried. I was doing a decathlon before COVID. I was training for decathlon, so I got back into pole vault. I went to the UCLA track and trained with those guys. Um, it's it, it, nothing like decathlon training, man. To to, to well, <laughs> first of all, nothing like decathlon training to to humble you, right? Oh yeah, it's crazy. Um, and it, it, you think about, you know, those guys really are, uh, they were at one time the, the best athletes in the world. I, th I, I do, I do believe that some of the CrossFit guys are probably uh, mm, up there now. That's an interesting point. Cause yeah, the, the, the Olympic champion of the decathlete used to be called the world's, world's greatest, greatest athlete, athlete yeah. but maybe that's not. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, so just back to the, back to this, uh, foot health thing and the idea that, um, you know, you could be performing better just by wearing um, a, a minimalist shoe with uh, full toe articulation all day long. Uh, and in so doing, you're not really training. There's no stress on it, but you're just constantly um, moving it in different directions and different ranges and planes of motion, constantly uh, uh, rotating the ankle, for instance. So the ankle gets stronger and more mobile. So that when, then when you do put on your cleats or your basketball shoes, you're quite mm -hmm. less likely to hurt yourself if you roll it the wrong way off of someone else's mm -hmm. shoe. Um, you know, I just was listening to uh, someone's podcast. I forget who it was. Oh, it was Kelly Sturette. And Kelly said, you know, he was quoting something we all know, which is that uh, studies show that if you walk 8,000 steps a day on average, you have a 50% uh, decreased risk of mortality, right? That, that Like of all the Mm -hmm. Of all the things you can do to live longer, mm -hmm. uh, walking is probably the single greatest thing you could do. And everyone should walk. And dude, we're bipedal. That's the whole concept of being human is, is to walk. Uh, and before, you know, before a thousand years ago, um, we, there was, there were no chairs. There were no other chairs maybe, but you know, there were no, you didn't sleep on a bed. You, 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 you know, you didn't sit on a chair to rest. You squatted on your haunches to rest. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you've followed any of Katie Bowman's work, you know, you're, you're changing positions all day long, sometimes reclining mm -hmm. directly on the ground, sometimes sitting cross-legged, uh, quite often squatting. 
um, but most of the time still walking, standing, moving on your feet. And it just, it makes so much sense that because we have this sort of built-in requirement to walk, that we ought to maximize the ability to do that and optimize the opportunity to do that, you know? Mm. Well, I saw that firsthand. I'll use this as another opportunity to talk about my Hadza experience oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. Maasai. Oh, man. I, exactly right. Yeah. Squatting, reclining, moving, walking, not no jogging. I know you're, you, you're not a fan of that endless jogging anymore. You, nope. You've been, been there, there done, done that. that. Yep. And they, you know, you, you walk, you do like a fast walk or you sprint. Yep. Yeah. And a fast walk, by the way, is totally heel toe, right? So walking is heel toe and, but it's, but it's heel toe without any sort of G forces. So when you're running and you land on your heel, like you would, if you were a three hour and 30 minute marathoner, um, mm -hmm. the G forces are, are significant. You know, it's multiples of your body weight. Um, mm -hmm. when you are walking, it's just an easy roll from across the heel through the foot, push off of the big toe, do it, repeat, rinse and repeat. Uh, so walking is the, is the de facto form of trend and, and the, the, um, obligatory f uh, form of transportation for humans and then sprinting. And so if you look at, at the Hadza and the Maasai and anyone, and any of the, 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 the um, the tracking, uh, tribes, they, they track by, by walking and by, you know, crouching and by hiding behind trees and then sprinting to the next, to the next, uh, hiding point. Right. And that's how they track an animal. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't run 10 kilometers after an animal and then hurl a spear and be, and be done with it. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the original, uh, human hunters were, were, were good at tracking and they had this, this, uh, you know, nuchal ligament that allowed them to, to, to run certain amounts of distances. And then of course they have the sweat glands to allow them to cool off uh, in the heat. So they would outlast an animal by tracking it and then eventually exhausting it. Yeah. Yeah. I, persistence hunting, but still like some people push back. I'm like, I don't think we, we weren't just like jogging at a slow rate forever. It's like that. And that's maybe not the main thing we did. It was more of hunting and tracking than just straight up persistence. Hunting. Well, and, and it was even, even the tracking wasn't done every day. It wasn't like, you know, these guys are putting in 80 miles a week of training to go hunt a beast. Uh, they were trained yeah. for life. It just whatever they did. And this goes back to my original primal blueprint, 10 laws, right? Move around a lot at a low level of activity, aerobic activity, uh, lift heavy things, not a lot, but just, you know, li lift heavy things twice a week mm -hmm. and then sprint once in a while. And that would mimic the original human um, you know, to-do list really for, for a week, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I do. And just back to one more thing about me is that growing up barefoot, I had to learn to not heel strike. Like I just, there was no other way to run. If you're barefoot, I, my whole life was yep. barefoot almost. And I would have to toe strike run. And so I already, even if I did wear normal shoes, I would still toe strike because that's all I knew. Well, and so that's how, when you, when you look at the, uh, the runners from the Rift Valley, when you look at the Kenyans and, uh, and the Ethiopians in, uh, you know, in, in marathons, they trained in the mountainous country of Kenya, running barefoot to and from school uh, with that same sort of uh, midfoot strike uh, um, gait. And so then you put shoes on them and you're not going to change that. You're not going to, you know, you're mm -hmm. not going to revert back yeah. after after 14 years of running 10 miles each way to school, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to revert back once you put shoes on to, uh, uh, you know, to a hit, to be a, any sort of a heel striker. So you're right. They, they, that's ingrained in them. So what else, because you're about to turn 70, which is amazing. Yeah. You just posted on Instagram. You're looking great. Everyone should listen up to your advice. Like I said, still, still holds strong. Primal Blueprint still holds up. What is, so after all these years, what is your latest and greatest? Like, what is your sort of diet look like the recap for people yeah. or like, how do I look like Mark? Um, well, so for me, um, you know, it's, it's largely carnivore. Um, I don't eat breakfast. I get up in the morning. I have a cup of coffee. Um, I work out anywhere between, 
um, starting at 9.30 to starting at the latest at 10.30. Um, I try to do something every day. So today it was a, it was a bike ride. Today, I, I, it's the longest I've, done, I've gone in, in, in probably three years. I went an hour and 45 mm. on the bike. Um, normally, I try to keep it to about an hour, hour and 10. And yesterday, I paddled for an hour and 10. But then the other days, I lift weights. and I try to keep my weight sessions to less than 45 minutes, the lift heavy things part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then lunch, uh, you know, what I have today, I had uh, at the restaurant next by next door has this uh, tuna poke bowl, which is a lot of tuna. It's just like it's it's flown in fresh every day from Hawaii. Mm. Um, it's mm. prime Italian, prime 112. And so I get the, it's a treat for me. And it's like probably 60 grams of protein in this thing. It's amazing. So I had that for lunch. Um, and then I'll have for dinner, I'll have a steak. I have a steak almost every night. Uh, probably in New York. I've, I've been through the Wagyu's. I've been through all of the, the variations. I still like probably a good New York steak the best. I'll have that and maybe either a, a little bit of salad or some steamed broccoli, um, glass of wine, maybe two glasses of wine. And that's that's like my day. I mean, if I have anything, mm. any sort of treat in there, my wife has been making a, uh, a protein bread. It's amazing. She makes a, a sort of a sweet it's almost like a dessert, but it's got 20 grams of protein per slice. And she's, it, she uses it making uh, um, um, bear performances, bear nutrition's uh, uh, performance oh, protein. BPN, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and then she's adapted her own recipe. So I'll have a slab of that with butter on it for dessert once in a while. But dessert then becomes another 20 grams of protein and a bunch of fat. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I love it. Wow. No, oh, you're living the life. Yeah, it sounds... I mean, I guess I landed on this because I've been listening to you and I've been following the ancestral principles. But yeah, I mean, too mad, two meals a day seems like the sweet spot. I mean, it you wrote is, a book on it, right? <laughs> I, no, I wrote a book called Two Meals a Day. And it is a sweet spot. And it's and it's largely because once you become metabolically flexible, and we've talked about this maybe in the past, but the, this mm -hmm. concept of metabolic flexibility really describes your ability to extract energy from fat. Uh, when there's no other substrate around. And so it, it describes fat adaptation, certainly keto adaptation. So the brain becomes, uh, winds up loving ketones in the absence of other food, uh, other calories. Uh, but you can certainly still burn glucose and glycogen as easily as you ever could. Uh, so, so developing metabolic flexibility um, allows you to burn a lot of stored body fat, which in turn allows you to go long periods of time without feeling hungry and without needing to eat. And it's almost like you don't want to eat. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I'm not hungry. I don't want to eat. Oh, yeah. So I always work out fasted. Um, and usually after a workout's done, I, I still don't eat for an hour or two or three, you know, after I finish the workout. And then when I'm hungry, I eat when, and then when dinner rolls around, I make an occasion of it. So dinner is my, you know, sort of my primary enjoyment meal of the day. I certainly want to make that um, you know, uh, a, a pleasurable experience. I want to have every bite of food I eat. Um, uh, taste great. But I also, uh, you know, recognize that over the years, I've realized most people eat far too many calories. The fact that you can get away with eating a lot of calories and not show it doesn't mean it's good for you. So, you know, our, our thought experiment um, a mm -hmm. while back was rather than seeing how much we can eat and not gain weight, what if we, what if we tried to see how little we could eat and maintain muscle mass or get stronger have all the energy you want all day long, never get sick, and most importantly, not be at the effect of hunger. And it turns out, in my case, like I was able to drop 30% of my otherwise normal caloric intake without any adverse effects at all. Mm. So I think the human body is very resilient to that sort of, uh, th those amounts of, of uh, calorie shifts. And I suspect that most people are eating way too many, way more calories than they need to eat to optimize their health, despite the fact that they're not gaining weight or they're not showing it, you know? Well, you might be gaining visceral fat too without knowing it. Yeah. And yep. no, I, I'm kind of there. So this is a concept of like nutrients versus energy, which we're introducing in the film. It's nutrient density. It's like, well, you're eating a really nutrient dense diet, then you're getting more bang for your buck, yep. right? You are getting yep. all the protein, vitamins, minerals you need for less calories. Right. And so... Well, yeah, I mean, that's the key to life. We, it's a very simple concept, right? And then we have to make this into this whole film series, six episodes. And first episode's on evolution, right? Yep. We do yep. 
we do do that. And then this, but we get into this protein and nutrient concept of versus energy calories. What do you, what do you think about that? Cause I don't, for some reason it's not talked about. It's like, there are nutrient calories, including protein and there are energy calories. No, like, I mean, I said, different. no, no, no. I mean, I was, I was one of the first ones, like I wrote a blog post in 2007 called the context of calories. Mm. And in that post, I said, why are we even assigning a caloric value to protein? Certainly the first 40 mm -hmm. or 50 grams of protein you consume every day does not get combusted. So why would you even assign a caloric value to it? It gets incorporated into uh, rep you know, muscle repair, muscle building, en enzyme construction, uh, goes into the amino acid sink for uh, a reservoir for use later on. So we don't even, we shouldn't even give it a caloric value. We should only start assigning caloric value to the, to the protein that we eat, say above 120 grams a day that might get involved in gluconeogenesis or, or something like that. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that concept. Like what, like when you talk about a daily energy requirement, you talk about, you know, thermic values and how do you, how do you craft a diet based on percentages of calories, it's it's really immaterial. Look, I was never a calories in, calories out guy. I'm a calories burned versus calories stored guy, right? So as long as you burn more calories or equivalent calories to what you store, that's all that matters. And that becomes a hormonal uh, con uh, construct where you uh, the foods you eat and when you eat them dictate what hormones get secreted, which in turn dictates what happens to those foods some of which become combustible as uh, glucose or fat, some of which become incorporated as, uh, co as structural components as amino acids. So it's a, it's a complex equation, Brian, and you can't just reduce it to, uh, you know, numbers like percentage. What, what are your macros? Like, I hate mm -hmm. this. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I don't know what my macros are, but I do know that I'm, I'm protein centric. So as long as I get 120 to 150 grams of protein a day on average, Everything else is like, doesn't even matter, right? It really doesn't matter because I could go days without eating any carbs. On the other hand, um, I don't like to pack on the fat. I don't like to say, oh, well, shit, if I only had, you know, if I had 120 grams of protein today and that's 480 grams, call it 580, sorry, 580 calories, 500 calories, uh, where do I make the rest of the calories up? Well, I better eat, you know, a thousand or a hundred grams of, of, uh, of fat to make up the difference. No, not if I'm not hungry. I don't need to. My intuitive sense of hunger and thirst guide my life, right? And and if I'm hungry, I eat. And if I'm not hungry, I don't eat. And it's pretty simple that way. Now, you have to develop the metabolic flexibility to get to that point. But once you do, it is the most freeing. I mean, I can't, I can't even describe the empowerment that it gives you to like untether yourself from that hunger, appetite, and craving. Uh, machine that everybody else is sort of beholden to. That's the main goal. That's the main goal is enjoyment. It's living long, living strong, all the stuff you talk about. We're going to put this on the film. Um, this is great. I, we're running out of time here. Do you want to um, do a contest for the shoes? Yeah. Hey, I got, I got, I got a funny. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a thing online, a challenge online where you try to, you don't have to do it online, but where you try to um, stand on one foot. It's called the old man challenge. Stand on one foot, bend over, put on a sock and a shoe, tie the shoe on while you're still resting on one foot, hop to the foot that is now shod and bend over and put on the other sock and the other shoe and then tie that and then and then hop down. Hmm. Right. Um, so we're doing it with Paluvas. Well, Paluva, we have a five toed sock and those things are a bitch to get on. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, I mean, I can I can slip my my bare feet into my regular paluvas and I don't wear socks. So it's easy. So I can put that on pretty, pretty easily. But the challenge is to put on the socks and the shoe and tie it and then hop to the other foot, put on the sock and get each toe into the mm. toe space because five toed socks are, are, are tough to put on. So I was thinking about some sort of a challenge we could do there. Like, uh, um, you know, if you, uh, what do you think? What, what's, well, what's they can good... tag me in the story, they could tag me and you or Paluva in the story. Yeah. And then we could like, just go through the stories and find people. The Instagram right, let's, story. Uh, yeah. I mean, let's do that. Let's do, let's, let's tag an Instagram. We're, we are where Paluva, W E A R P E L U V A, where Paluva on Instagram. And if people want to go buy 
choose right now, we're at paluva.com. Um, but I would say, yeah, if you, if, cause you'll be able to track this with yours. If, if on your Instagram, mm -hmm. people can tag two people, right. They will, they'll be, uh, you know, in a drawing for a pair of Paluvas. Well, let's that? do it. Let's do right. it. And I got a code sapien too. If people want to buy the shoes, you get a discount. If you use the yep. code sapien. That's right. And, uh, yeah, let's just tag it. Just tag us in the story and tag some, some friends and let's do it. Why not give them a free pair? Yeah, all right. So somebody, somebody will get a free pair of shoes out of that. I'll make sure that happens. And, uh, uh, yeah. So tag some friends. Cause we, we want, we want people to be trying this out. I want to hear your feedback and I want to, you know, we're, you know, like with my food company, I want to change the way the world eats with my footwear company. I want to change the way the world walks. I want to mm -hmm. improve foot health for everyone. Well, I'm on board. Let's do it. Thanks, Mark. And All right, Brian. Uh, yeah, Good we'll talking. see you soon. We'll try to get you and Kyle down here. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. All right. Take care, man.